It's possible that he never realized how much he would look back on those days when he was still in them. One of the tricks that your mind will play with you, time being linear, the way that it is, without the ability to move around in time, you get a bit stuck inside of it like a railroad car. You can't jump the tracks, and you can miss the fact that sometimes the good old days are the ones that you're actually in. It's when you look back later, when you reflect, you see fondness, you forgive all the things you complained about then. For him, he would spend the rest of his life reflecting back on three jam-packed years, three years of wandering, of homelessness, of sleeping wherever they stopped, and depending on the generosity of strangers, three years of blisters on his feet, so many blisters that sometimes it was easier to walk barefoot than with those worn leather sandals, three years of miracles and teachings and diary entries, journals, transcriptions, three years of wondering where it was all going to lead, three years with Jesus. For the rest of his life, he would refer back to those formative years. He was young. By most estimates, he's 13 or 14 years old around the time he starts following Jesus. About the same age Mary would have been when she found out she'd be carrying Jesus. And all the things he learned, all the miracles he'd seen, all the teachings that he heard Jesus give, it would take him the rest of his life to unpack it. Maybe that's why the Lord allowed him to live the longest. He'd wonder about that fairly often. We celebrate young life or long life, but I wonder if for John, it was a bit of a, a bit of a punishment. I bet he was ready to leave. And there, banished and exiled on the island of Patmos, all the other disciples were dead. He was the only lone survivor. And he wondered if this is how it was supposed to go. You guys remember in the closing pages of his gospel, after Jesus comes back to life, after Jesus has the one-on-one -on -one with Peter, he says to Peter, Peter, one day somebody's going to execute you. And Peter says what any of the rest of us would say. Well, what about him? And you remember, Jesus points at John and goes, hold on, hold on. If I want him to be here when I get back, what's that got to do with you? You follow me. But a rumor went out at that point that John wouldn't die by execution. Even, Joe, even though John said that's not what he said. And it embarrassed him. But now as he's getting older and older and older, now after he's still alive, after they tried to execute him. Do you remember? This is how the story goes. John is the apostle, the disciple, the one that they handcuff, that they arrest, that they catch, that they try to kill, and he won't die. They say to him, shut up about Jesus, or we're going to drop you in a pot of boiling oil. And he goes, well, I guess you're going to have to drop me in a pot of boiling oil. And they do, and they pull him back out, and guess who's still there? <laughs> That's a plot twist. What do you do with a guy that just won't die? And you set him on an island. They exile him to Patmos. And so John sits there. He has all this time to reflect, all this time to think, all this time to remember those days with Jesus. What would it feel like when there on the island, that Jesus who you miss so much, that Jesus who you remember so fondly and so passionately and so well, what would it feel like if he then appeared to you and he goes write this down that's where we're dropping in this morning if you've got your bibles open up to revelation chapter 2 we started a series last week called the letters to the churches in two chapters of the book of revelation the easiest book of the bible to find it's the last one you don't need your table of contents for this one just go to the last page and back up a bit in those first three chapters, you'll find seven little notes, seven little emails to seven churches that actually existed. We hit the first one last week. Kevin teased it a bit for us the week before. Jane preached last week about the first church. And where we're dropping in today is a letter, a, a short note, three verses long, to a church that actually existed. And these have been preserved for us to look at today. And what we've decided as a church is we would study these 
letters, we would read these letters and ask, okay, what implica implications does this have for us as a body of believers today? Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 says this, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Lord Jesus, as we, as we set in on these words, I pray that you would use them to speak to us, that you'd make them clear. Thank you for preserving them for us all these years. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, some years ago, I had the unfortunate task of having to tell my kids that one of their dogs had passed away. I don't know if you've ever had to do this. It was a shocking experience. We had two dogs at the time. They were named Daisy and Bauer. And both were older Dotsons, older wiener dogs. We got Daisy when we got married, and sometime later we got Bauer so that she would have someone to play this, to play with. Then we began having kids. We bought a home not far from here with a fenced-in backyard. There was yard and then fence and then land beyond the fence and a bridge into the woods. And so we would let Daisy and Bauer out in the mornings to go play in the backyard, to lay in the sun, to be lazy old dogs. Then at the ends of the days, we'd put the children to bed, and then we'd call the dogs in, and we'd put them to bed too. But that night, Bauer didn't come in. We searched and searched while the kids were asleep, but there was no sign of him. The next morning, we could see him on the strip of land beyond the fence, and he wasn't moving. Luckily, we found him there without the kids noticing. It broke our hearts, but we were thankful that we had time to form a plan. Before the kids found out, I dug a hole. That is a surreal experience, burying an, even an animal. It's, you're reminded of that passage in the Bible that says dust to dust, like you're putting it back in the earth. I became painfully aware of how short a time we have and how just surreal, shockingly surreal this all is. And again, I had the misfortune of having to explain to my kids what happened. The youngest two, we only had three at the time, the youngest two we weren't incredibly worried about because they were so young, they weren't going to get it anyway. I was mostly concerned about Benjamin. I remember picking him up at school. He was seven years old. I got him out of school, and I took him to get ice cream so that we could just talk about it. I could answer any questions that he might have. I broke to him the news as gently as I could that Bauer had closed his eyes on this side of eternity and opened them on the other, and he took it as well as, I guess, a seven-year-old can. It's a, it's a big concept to grapple with. I was watching him do the math, watching him work it out, asked him if he had any questions, and I wrote some of them down. I reflect on these from time to time. He said, why does Bauer get to go to heaven, but Daisy's still stuck here? <laughs> Daisy's older and meaner. <laughs> and then he said, wait, maybe that's why. Daisy needs to get nicer first before God will let her in. <laughs> I love the logic there. It's like if you're here and you're old, Benjamin assumes you're mean, and God's not letting you in until you mellow out a little bit. He went on, I think Daisy's so mean because she's old, in which case she's never going to die because she's so old. That makes her mean. His next thing, he goes, Dad, I have bad news. Emma broke up with me today. He has his dad's attention span, I think. She says she's too young to have a boyfriend. He was seven. I kind of agree with Emma. He said, Dad, when Daisy dies and the angel comes down to get her, we should see if that angel will take Bauer his ball on her way back. He's going to miss his ball. I know. I did the same thing. And then the next thing he said was, Dad, you're old too. <laughs> when you die, should we bury you in the woods behind our house? 
said, son, that's a felony. <laughs> that last one stung a bit. I think it stung because of the aging process. Like, I was so aware of my age. I had buried an animal that morning. I was a little bit sore. The weekend before, I'd played basketball with some college guys that I know, and I am way too old to do that. I was feeling every bit of my 40 years. So when Benjamin said, Dad, you're the oldest in our family, it's like I wanted to say, oh, I am well aware of that fact. We... we, We deny the aging process as a culture, don't we? We kind of hide it, try to ignore it, never talk about it. In fact, I would say, I would go so far as to say is that death as an entire subject is not something we're very comfortable talking about. And I'm not sure why that is. Because it's all around us. In fact, it's the only thing we're guaranteed. We don't know what will happen to us this week. We don't know where we'll be living in 10 years. But we do know that at least at this point, the death rate hovers somewhere around 100%. Like, we're all promised that that's going to happen. And yet we try to remove this reality as much as we can. We try to never talk about it. We try to protect our children from it. And I just wonder, like, this is so different than the way that the early church had to be confronted by it. This was a reality of what they were experiencing on a daily basis, right? And this letter alone, the one that we just read, this is kind of the first thing that Jesus says to them right off the bat. We said a moment ago, these letters are from Jesus, and I don't, I don't want to stumble past that. But we, we know so much about Jesus from the Gospels. I think sometimes we fail to realize as much as the, of the world that has changed as a result of his existence happened without him writing anything. You ever thought about that before? Like, he changed everything. Literally split time in half. He's the one upon whom our faith is built. Jesus, Son of God. King of kings, Lord of lords. He came into our world wearing skin 2,000 years ago and changed everything. And yet he did it without ever having written a book. Never traveled abroad, never held public office. He appeared on no talk shows, no news programs, no blog websites or magazine covers. He had no pedigree to speak of. His family was not socially elite. And yet today, it is this Jesus and his motley crew, not the emperors or the rulers of his day, who shaped Western society. We name our children things like John, Matthew, Thomas, Peter. We name our dogs Caesar and Nero. (laughs) Usually when a person dies, their influence immediately begins to recede When their life is extinct. And yet, with Jesus, his influence goes the entirely opposite way. His influence was greater a hundred years after his death. Five hundred years. A thousand years. Two thousand years. It's difficult to imagine our world without him. Every time you reboot your computer, every time you look at your phone, every time you write a check, you are reminded that some monk goes, okay, we need a new way to keep track of time. We've got to come up with a new system because a man named Jesus existed and split everything in half. And he did all of this without ever having written a book. I don't mean to to belabor the point. It's just fascinating to me that in our Bibles, in the first, in in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, we have Jesus' words, right? This is the closest he came to writing something down. He wrote letters to churches through John. He goes, John, get out your pen. I got something to say. There's seven churches that exist. I want you to write a note to each of them. Here's what I want you to say. These are his words. This is important. This is a big deal. And sometimes I think because it's in the book of Revelation, which feels a little mysterious to us anyway, it's shrouded in a bit of mystery. I think sometimes we stumble past just how significant this is. And boy, I don't think we should. I want to harp out here for a minute. This is why we're doing this teaching series. Because I think what Jesus has to say to the churches is important for us here today. And yes, it's a little confusing. But there's a cheat code. Did you know there's a cheat code? 
Like the way to understand these letters, this is so important. In each of these letters, Jesus addresses a church. He says, this is to this church. So he tells us what church that he's writing to. And then he refers to himself. He goes, here's who's writing the letter. And the way he refers to himself reveals why he's writing to them. This, that is so important. That's going to unlock everything for you as you study this. The way, the self-referential title that he, what he calls himself is what he's, it's the subject of the email. He goes, okay, by what he refers to himself as, this is what I'm writing to you about. You're going to see that in just a minute. And then he goes on to praise certain things that they're doing well in their church. Then he goes on to say certain things they need to do better. Then he makes a warning at the end and signs off. This is the cheat code. And with this information, we now drop back into the letter to see what he has to say to them and to see what he has to say to us. So going verse 8, the one who is the first and the last. Okay, so beginning and end. And then look at it. Who was dead but is now alive. Oh. Okay, the way he's referring to himself is by saying, I'm the one who's writing here is the first and the last was dead and is now alive. He's writing to them about death. The elephant in the room, the thing no one in our culture wants to talk about, but the very thing that the people in this church would have been unable to escape. They wouldn't have been able to ignore this. We've gone to great lengths in our culture to cover it up, but the church in Smyrna couldn't. Their church couldn't live in denial like we can because they were being persecuted on a daily basis. You guys, there are reports of the things that were going on in this church, the persecution that they were enduring that are too disgusting. The details are too disturbing for me to read to you from this stage. But suffice it to say, if you were a Christian who was alive in the first century, this was the most dangerous place for you to live. Not among the most dangerous. This was the most dangerous place for you to live. Because in all likelihood, if you were a Christian, you were going to die at the hands of persecution. It was just a matter of time. And I guess what's different about the early church is that they didn't live in denial about this. They didn't try to cover it up or act like it wasn't a thing. They couldn't. Instead, they lived with great anticipation about the fact they would die. Isn't that crazy? In 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle Peter, who's hitting old age and is aware that people are wanting to persecute him for being a Christian, he goes, boy, I'm about to, I love the way he says this, lay aside this earthly tent. That's how he, he goes, okay, my soul is what's real here. This body is just a vehicle. I'm about to set this aside so I can go be with Jesus. That's how matter of fact he is about it. In Philippians chapter 1, the apostle Paul writes a letter, and he, he can literally hear the executioner sharpening his sword in the other room. It's about to go down. And he goes, I don't know which is better. Like, maybe the Lord will get me out of this, in which case it'll be more, you know, service for you. But I kind of want to die. Like, wait, what? He's like, it'd be better by far to get to go be with Jesus. This was the attitude of the early church. There was no threat of death. They're like, I don't, you're going to kill me? Shut up about Jesus or you'll kill me. Oh, please don't make me go be with Jesus. That has no threat to me at all. I don't, I don't care if you kill me. I want to see him. And this is the attitude of this church here, right? In verse 9, he says, I know, so this is, verse 8, we'll back up. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead but is now alive. I know your afflictions and your poverty. I love the, that, just the first two words of verse 9. I know. Circle, underline, highlight. How would it feel if you were in this church, if you were suffering, if you were persecuted? With all that you've been through, you open this letter from Jesus to you, and the first words you read are the fact that he knows. He knows what you're experiencing. Wouldn't that almost be enough? Sometimes isn't that what we, it's just the testimony of Scripture over and over is that Jesus, he knows. He's not unaware. Single moms struggling to make ends meet and raising your children in a God-honoring home, he knows how hard that is. 
Husbands, men in the room, father who carry fear and anxiety on a daily basis of providing. How would it how would it feel to receive a message from the Lord to just say, hey, I know how hard that is. I know what you're walking with. I can't tell you the number of times in moments of despair and fear in the middle of the night where I've clung to this thought that Jesus knows. And sometimes we think of suffering as something to race through to get to the other side of. And what if it's in sinking into it that we go, you know about this. You're closer to, this isn't foreign to you. You know exactly what I'm experiencing. In Hebrews chapter 4, the author of the book of Hebrews says that we don't have a Savior who's unfamiliar with what we experience. Did you know that? This is remarkable. This is different from any other religion on the planet. Right In the Greek mind, the gods back then were classified by a Greek word called apatheia, which is the word we get apathy from. They don't feel anything. And then we get a God who goes, I feel everything you're feeling. I have felt it. I did feel it when I was there. The author says, we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tested as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus, the Son of God, enthroned in heaven, the Bible says, can sympathize with our weaknesses. This word for sympathize means he suffers along with us. Guys, that's a big deal. What makes this difference, Jesus added humanity to his deity. He lived among us. When you've, when you've been there, when you're talking to someone who's been there too, doesn't that make all the difference, let me say it another way. We might hear of some tragedy at a high school and feel a measure of sorrow, but it's nothing like the pain we'd feel if that were the high school we attended. That's different. You guys, we live in the high school he attended. He's not unfamiliar with our human condition. He knows fear. He knows pain. He knows rejection, grief. He knows struggle and hardship and blame, and regret, and confusion. He knows loneliness. Did you know that loneliness was just labeled by the Surgeon General this week as the new public health epidemic in the United States? Do you realize this? This is in the news. Dr. Vivek Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General, released an 85-page advisory saying loneliness is the new public health crisis. On the same level as when we released all that stuff about smoking some years ago, they're now going, boy, people are more alone than they've ever been. This is not new to the human condition. It's just that we as a culture are finally beginning to go, wow, that is a problem. And Jesus goes, yeah, I know loneliness. I know, I've, I experienced it too. I am not unfamiliar with what you're going through. I felt it. Verse 9, I know about the slander of those who say they're Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. What's unbelievable is that this is a place where secular history and church history and Bible history all kind of combine. This thing that John is writing that Jesus says he knows about, we know from other documents was the actual thing that was going on back then. Essentially, the shortest way to say it is this. The Roman Empire knew as an institution not to persecute the Jewish people. Occasionally, an emperor would come along and persecute the Jewish people, and he'd end up wishing he hadn't kicked that hornet's nest. It never worked out for them. So over years, just different emperors come along and, and just realize, hey, I'm not going to mess with the Jewish people, right? And so when Christianity started, they, the Roman Empire, who's not familiar with religion, right? They just go, you're a bunch of weird Jews, right? That, that's what they thought they were. It was a knockoff Jewish cult. And so they left the Christians alone too. But the Jews hated the Christians. And so the Jews would go to the Roman Empire and sell out the, the Christians, saying, no, 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 you need to go get them, right? And Jesus goes, yeah, I know about that. Like we know, he doesn't say here the description of what's going on. We've read this in other places. John had no way of knowing this was going on. He's isolated on an island. And yet Jesus tells him that he knows about it. Guys, you can't make this up. This is a fact. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews but are not. They are a synagogue of Satan. Jesus goes, I know about what's going on. 
I've seen it. They're working on Satan's behalf. I'm not surprised by it. And look what he says next. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. But I thought you knew. You just said that you know. Like, so why you're going to stop, right? You're going to make the suffering stop. You just said that you know about this. I do know. It's actually going to get much worse. You think it's bad now. Those are just the appetizers. You're not going to remove my suffering? You're not going to stop. You're going to tell me that you know and expect me to believe that you would knowingly allow me to go through it anyway? Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Ooh, that one hurts, doesn't it? Well, so many times I think we have these false notions about suffering. One of them that impl- it implies that when you're suffering, maybe you're somehow outside of God's will and you're being punished. But then you read about this church and you go, well, that's not true. It can't be. He says, no, 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 you're doing great. It's about to get worse for you. Another belief we sometimes have about suffering is that if we are suffering, Jesus either doesn't know or doesn't care, because if he knew, he would remove it, but this church also proves that's not true. He knows about it, and he's going to allow it. We're biologically wired to avoid pain. We sense suffering as something to get away from as quickly as possible, but Let me ask you something. If Jesus is with us in a different way, in a new way, in a more tangible way in the midst of our suffering, I mean, is it crazy to think that's the place we should want to be? What if we learn to embrace our suffering and learn there in that painful place to experience there his presence. I know this is a crazy idea, but if I'm doing the math right, I mean, you got there with me. Sometimes suffering is the place we experience him more. In fact, most people I know who have come very close to Jesus only got there because of suffering. We sang a song a minute ago that Skip wrote. I'm not going to tell you which one, but it dawned on me, and I didn't even know we were singing that one today. He wrote that from a painful place. That song that we just sang as a church came from a season he was in of suffering in which he experienced Jesus in a different way. One of the early church fathers said, in that painful place where we find ourselves, we need not cry very loud. He is nearer to us than we think. And, okay, so if his nearness is as sweet as the Bible describes it to be, Maybe we should learn not to avoid suffering, but to embrace it and find him there. I mean, I think that's what's going on with this church. Look at verse 10. Jesus goes, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. The 10 days here can mean a couple of different things. Some commentators think it refers to 10 years, which was the length of the reign of Diocletian, who was the emperor during this wave of persecution. Others think it refers to the 10 emperors whose reigns Christians were persecuted under. Both are true and both are significant and powerful. And Jesus says, be faithful, even to the point of death, circle, underline, highlight, even if it costs you everything, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. You guys, by all accounts, this church took this to heart. They would meet together, even though they knew it was likely, not possible, but likely, that they would be caught, arrested, tortured, eventually killed. Jesus writes to them, and he goes, keep going. Keep going. Go for it. You might die. Isn't that exciting? Believers in Smyrna were being thrown into prison, not to imprison them, The Roman Empire back then didn't put you in jail to punish you. They put you in jail till they could get around to killing you. 
They're being thrown into prison. And this wave of Christianity was so strong that it's actually said that Domitian would have to send out the persecutors in ships because they were passing out from exhaustion. The amount of Christians that they were slaughtering. And Jesus goes, yeah, I know about it. Keep going. Hang in there. They're being tied to posts. They're being lit on fire, stoned, slashed with swords, fed to lions, used as torches and entertainment just for worshiping Jesus publicly. (laughs) Do you think there were a lot of casual Christians in Smyrna? Right? If you knew that every time you met to get, like, what we're doing right now, like, I might get lit on fire. I might get fed to a lion, right? Would you be quick to meet to get, like, would you just casually throw around the name of Jesus if you knew you could be arrested for it? There's probably not a lot of casual I look at this church and I go, okay, there's probably not a lot of casual Christians in this church. Let me ask you something. Do you think there's a lot of casual Christians here? In America, in South Carolina, in Myrtle Beach, in Midtown, in this room? Like, would you have done this today if you knew you could be arrested for it? Would you have still come out? Would you still be singing with your hands spread wide? If you knew someone could see those hands and put a handcuff on your wrist and haul you away, away from your children to execute you. See, we have no idea what persecution is. We enjoy freedom so much, and I'm certainly thankful for it. But sometimes I think as the North American church, we've made it so easy to go to church. (laughs) That persecution to us is, well, they changed the worship style. Oh, my God, how did you get through that? They took away my parking spot. And, and guys, this would be normal, I guess. Like, I wouldn't be that bothered by it if it wasn't for this church. Like, I read this church. I got to be honest. This church bothers me. Because all of the way we kind of do church and this easy churchism in our, in our country That we, again, we're thankful for the freedom. This easy way of doing it would be normal if it wasn't for this church. A church that's risking it all, that literally is putting it all on the line and going, I don't care, kill me. I just, whatever. You know, this is the only church that doesn't receive a rebuke. We gave you that formula earlier about the the letters that Jesus writes to the churches and how each one has like, you better fix this. This is the only church that doesn't get that. So from these letters, this is the only church that's doing it right. And I read this letter and I go, oh, oh, that's really indicting. Right? One of the early, one of the early leaders of this church, there's a guy in secular history named Polycarp. I've told you before, the places where church history and secular history intersect, that's really interesting to me. We know because of secular history. He's not mentioned in the Bible, but secular history. There's a man named Polycarp who was discipled by the Apostle John, who wrote this letter for Jesus, right? The Apostle, the one who was walking with Jesus from such a young age, and all of his friends died of old age, they were, sorry, they were executed, and John's put on an island because he just won't die. Well, according to history, someone finally goes, you know what, we should probably go check on John. Like, that was a while ago, he's probably still out there. So they sail out there, they find John, he's an old man writing letters, you know, they're like, oh, we're really sorry about that, that was embarrassing. We're going to bring you back to Ephesus, and they bring him back to Ephesus, and there in Ephesus, he, he disciples a man named Polycarp. Polycarp becomes the pastor of this church in Smyrna, according to history. And, and at 86 years old, 86 years old, Polycarp is arrested. You want to talk about, I mean, imagine arresting an 86-year-old man. That would feel weird. Polycarp was placed under arrest and sentenced to die. 86 years old. And they told him all he had to do to avoid death was to renounce Jesus. That's it. And he wouldn't do it. They begged him to. Nobody wants to execute an 86-year-old man. The chief magistrate in Smyrna 
reportedly, this is documented, asked him, what harm is it to say, Polycarp, Lord Caesar? Just say Lord Caesar and no one has to die. And he wouldn't do it. And according to history, he's led into the middle of a stadium and given another chance. He's surrounded by cheering people, and he's just feet away from hungry, ravenous lions, and he still would not do it. When nothing would sway him, they tied him to a stake, and they threatened to light him on fire. They said, renounce Jesus, or we're going to light you on fire. And he wouldn't do it. They ended up lighting him and then piercing him with a sword as well. And with thousands of people listening, his last documented words were this. Four score and six years have I served the Lord, and he has never done me wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Bring forth what you will. I read that, and I'm like, are you kidding me? This is the pastor of this church. I, I, I know myself well enough to know that I would have come up with excuses. I would have been looking for a loophole. Most of us, I think if we're honest with ourselves, most of us would. I'd be going, well, God wouldn't want me to die, right? I got four kids at home. Like, I don't have to mean the words. I could just say that. Like, I'd be finding all these ways to get out uh, of, of, of having to give my life in this way. Not Polycarp. He's like, no, bring it on. This is an opportunity for me. To shine a light on Jesus. And and boy, I'd like to believe that I'd be able to do that. But if we're honest with ourselves, I don't think we would. Because we've gotten so casual in all these other places. Why do we think we wouldn't be casual here? We think we just up and one day decide to be a superstar? I think the reason Polycarp was able to be so committed in this way is because he'd lived committed up until that point. Every decision along the way, the small things. Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. Polycarp had these daily disciplines, I bet, that prepared him for this opportunity. And most of us can't get serious about time alone with the Lord in the morning. But we think that if we're put on the spot, oh, I'd give my life for him. Are you sure? Most of us won't commit to a group. Most of us won't serve. I'll come to church if the lights are just right, the music's not too long, if the pastor doesn't preach too much. Sorry. They put out some food for me. And the second that that stops, oh, man, (laughs) this persecution. And we think we'd be a polycarp. I don't know. Like, I want to be a polycarp Christian. You know, the difference with a polycarp Christian is we want to honor God by how we suffer. We want to bring glory to God through our suffering. That's what polycarp Christians do. They're so in love with it. Like, okay, I don't want to suffer God, but if your presence is with me in the suffering, then, oh, man, I want your presence. It reminds me of, remember what Moses prayed in Exodus chapter 33? And God is so frustrated with the Israelites that he's like, listen, I got I to gotta, gotta get away from you guys. Like, you're driving me crazy. I'm going to kill all of you. So I'm going to send you into the promised land. I'm going to send you into paradise, but I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to dip, right? And Moses goes, wait, if your presence does not go with us, I don't want to go. If I don't get to have your presence, then even paradise, I don't want. I don't want it. And I go, man, I want to be so in love with God, with his presence, that, you know, say like, okay, if, it, if your presence is in the suffering, then I'm not going to try to run from it. I'm going to embrace it. I mean, that's a polycarp Christian. I'll use even this to throw the light back on Jesus. I told you we had a couple dogs a couple years ago. We've since gotten a couple cats. <laughs> There's a big difference between dogs and cats. Any dog people in the room? I see some hands, yeah. Any cat people in the room? It's a few of them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they, what I've learned is that God didn't make cats. He made, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> they call this cat and dog theology, and you may have heard me talk about it before, but a dog looks at you and says, oh, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, you must be God. 
A cat says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me. I must be God. <laughs> it is so true. And it is so often the way we approach our Father. Like, cat Christians can become feeling really entitled. When we suffer, we go, how could you allow this to me? Why Make this stop. End this now. Dog Christians go, all right. You're going to, okay, if this is what you got for me, I'm, I mean, you're God. I'm going to make you awesome. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to use this. This is the pivot that Polycarp makes. He goes, even in my suffering. Wait, suffering isn't something to run from? No, it's something to embrace. He goes, it's a ministry that you're entrusted with. Even in your suffering, you can make him famous. Polycarp goes, this isn't about me. This is about him. Are you kidding? Four score and six years have I served him. This ain't about me. And he has never done me wrong. How then can I blaspheme him? Bring forth what you will. See, it was easy for Polycarp to die for Christ because he'd spent his entire life viewing his relationship with him in that way. This is all about you. So what's my life? Take it. I don't care. He was serious. Like I said, I read about this church, and I go, man, if there's one church we could be like, it seems like it should be the one that doesn't get an indictment. And is this what we're being called to? To not being casual with our faith. So how do you know if you're too casual? I don't, do you spend time alone with God? Do you spend more time excusing behavior? than allowing God to change your behavior? Do you misquote the Bible to justify your own actions or beliefs? Which are all marks of being too casual, I think. Do you long for eternity? Do you view suffering as an opportunity to point people to Jesus, perhaps a ministry you've been entrusted with in your suffering. What if God is with you in your suffering, when you suffer? Some of the people I know who've come the closest to Jesus only got there through suffering. What if that's where his presence is? Are you so in love with his presence that you'd find it even there? Lord Jesus, we want to be people who look a bit like this church. It's so easy to grow casual with you, to allow the freedom that we enjoy, and we are thankful for it. It's so easy to allow that to make us consumers. I think you're calling us to be polycarps. Dogs. <laughs> Folks who are so in love with your presence that even in suffering, if we can find it there, we'll embrace it. Folks who are so committed to your fame that if suffering is what you've entrusted us with, we'll be good stewards even of that. So Jesus, convict us where we've fallen short. Give us a resolve. Highlight the places that need to change. Are we just checking boxes or are we really in love with you? Sometimes at the close of these services, friends, we, we just allow a moment for the Lord to search you. I've spent a long time talking. And his words are so much more important than mine. And sometimes in silence, we can hear him more clearly. And so we're going to take just a minute or two before the week fires up, and it will. It'll get real noisy real quick. 
But in this quiet place, we're just going to ask the Spirit to search us. We have ways of responding. If the Lord's stirring something up inside of you, we've got these kneelers at the front where you can come pray. Prayer candles. We've got a communion table. You can sit in your seat and jot down some notes or pray. You can fill out a communication card. One of these all-in cards that you'll see on the back of the seat in front of you. If there's something we can pray for you about, some step that you're considering taking, we take that very seriously. You can drop that in the prayer box, or sorry, the, um, the box between the doors on your way out. And just simply want to give you an opportunity to catalog what the Lord's doing. After a minute, we'll sing. Ashton will pray over us and you'll be dismissed. At that amen, you are free to go. If you're still processing, still talking, still connecting, there's no hurry. We've enjoyed worshiping with you. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Jesus, we pray you'd pour out your spirit on this room. Help us to confront where we may need to change.